Go. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, it's so good to be here with you today. I'm just uh, excited. Let me tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you, and I won't tell you what I told you. <laughs> I was a part of an association of churches called Calvary Ministries International for a number of years. And uh, the leader of that gang was a guy called Dr. Paul E. Paino. Dr. Paino kept saying, if we're not careful, we are going to lose our Pentecostal distinctive. Amen. And so I want to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about the baptism and the Holy Spirit. And then I want to talk to you about the speaking in tongues, about praying in the Spirit. And then we're going to talk about healing. Now you know that that is at least five sermons. We're going to do all that in about 40 minutes. <laughs> And you all know what it means when the pastor takes his watch off and sets it down here. Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Not a thing. So let's pray, shall we, Father? Thank you that you are so good to us. We just love you. We ask. We invite your Holy Spirit to come tonight to help us, to touch us to make us hungrier than we've ever been for more of you. Hungrier than we've ever been for your spirit to fill us and to use us to be light in a dark world, to bring your grace and your truth and your power into every circumstance that we encounter. Let us represent you well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, there's a law, one of the rules, let me say it that way, one of the rules of scriptural interpretation is called the law of repetition. Now, we have that in our family life. Did your mom ever say to you, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Why? Because it was important, right? So if something is repeated in the Bible, that says it's important, right? Now, there are not that many things that are in all four of the Gospels. You know that each Gospel presents the life of Jesus from a little bit different perspective for a little bit different audience. Matthew was a Jew, he was writing to Jews. So all through Matthew, you'll see uh, him quoting the Old Testament so that the Jews that he was writing to would see that what he was saying was fulfilling Old Testament scripture, right? Mark was writing more to Romans. And so the, the King James Version used the word straight away. You know, no messing around. Let's get this thing done. That was kind of Mark's approach. So all four of the Gospels quote the words of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the one who said, I baptize you with water, but there's somebody coming after me who's mightier than I am. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's repeated four times. Matthew, two in Mark, three in Luke, and the fourth time in the book of John. The law, the rule of repetition, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, that says to me that us understanding Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit is important. You know how many times it's recorded in the Gospels? Jesus talking to Nicodemus about being born again? One time. Am I saying that the baptism in the Spirit is more important than being born again? No, don't put words in my mouth. That's not what I'm saying. But I want you to understand, evidently the Holy Spirit thought that was important because he inspired four different guys to put it in the book. Okay. Now there's some confusion about terminology. 
I remember being in high school and I'm talking to a friend of mine who's Baptist about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says to me, Lonnie, we believe in that. It happens when, you're, when you get saved. And I'm like, well, it could, but it's not automatic. And what I came to realize some years later is that we were talking about two different things. He was talking about the Holy Spirit baptizing us into the body of Christ. That happens when you get saved. But that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about what John the Baptist, which I think is just hilariously ironic. It was John the Baptist who said, Jesus would baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Now that's different from the Holy Spirit baptizing us into the body of Christ, right? This is Jesus baptizing us in or with the Holy Spirit. Now, there are uh, some who say Speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The only problem with that is that the Bible doesn't say that. It's a minor problem. <laughs> it, there are five places in the book of Acts where people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In three of them, it specifically says they spoke in tongues and or prophesied. The other two, something supernatural happened because things were happening that people could see and they wanted what they could see. So it's an argument from inference. Someone asked, I'm not sure if it was Oral Roberts or who it was, but someone asked a leading uh, preacher, well, do you have to speak in tongues to have the baptism in the Holy Spirit? And his response, I thought was beautiful. He said, well, you don't have to, you get to. <laughs> That's a better perspective, isn't it? The problem is that we live in very, uh, excuse me, I'm just going to sneak down here and snag a Kleenex. I don't know why the anointing can make your nose run. <laughs> it's one of those byproducts, I guess. I don't know. <sighs> We live in a very rational society and culture where the focus is on your mind. The problem with that is that your mind is very limited. And God wants us to be led not by our minds, but by his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit is limitless. And so he can sometimes do things that we don't understand. Amen. If you understand everything your God does, your God is no bigger than you are. But if God is bigger than you are and smarter than you are, then he might do things that you don't understand and then you'll have to to trust him. That's what Proverbs says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. So we can trust when we don't understand. And that applies to a lot of spiritual things. Okay. So many, many years ago, on Lamar. I'm a young Pentecostal boy. I have not received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and I'm after it. And on Sunday nights, they would pastor would open the altars, and we'd come down and pray. And the band would always strike up a fast song. There was none of this have thy own way stuff. It was keep on the fire out. <laughs> something that had some fire to it, right? And it was a highly charged emotional atmosphere. And, and you'd have one person that, I mean, the people would all gather around you to pray for you because they're excited that you're seeking the baptism of the Spirit. 
And so you'd have one guy on the front, he'd be patting you on the chest saying, hang on, brother, hang on. And someone behind you is patting on the back, and they say, just let go, brother, just let go. And I'll never forget somebody saying, yield your tongue. Well, <laughs> I'm doing my best, and it is just not working. I just can't seem to get it. So one Sunday night, I prayed. Everybody left. I'm still praying, right? Pastor starts turning the lights off. <laughs> I gotta do something to get this Shields kid to, you know, get a grip here. So I finally gave up. And I headed down the aisle. The pastor was sitting on the back row. He says, sit down here. What's happening? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> That's the problem. Nothing's happening. I just can't seem to get it. And so he, he hands me the Bible, and it's open to Acts 2-4. And if you remember that verse, I, I, the only Bible we had when I was a kid, this was shortly after the dinosaurs died, <laughs> the only Bible that we had was the King James Version, right? So the King James, that's what I memorized all my scriptures in. I've tried to remember them in other versions, and they just don't stick. So the King James says this, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind, and cloven tongues of fire appeared and sat on each of them. And verse 4 says this, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And Pastor asked me, Lonnie, who spoke in tongues? Well, it's obvious. The Holy Spirit did. Because the concept that I had in my mind was that when you were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would just sort of take you over and you would, he would just put you on like you put your hand in a sock puppet. And he would make your lips move and make your tongue move and make your voice box work. And you'd be speaking in tongues. And that never happened. And so he asked me again. He says, read it again. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Who spoke in tongues? The Holy Spirit did. <laughs> I just finally goes, Lonnie, what is the subject of the sentence? <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to get out of my mistaken theological mindset to see what the Bible really says. That's a good idea for all of us. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's an understood subject. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. He said, Lonnie, when you're praying, do you ever, like in the back of your mind, do you ever hear something like tongues in the back of your mind when you're praying? And I'm like, oh, all the time. <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> well, maybe that's the Holy Spirit giving you the utterance. The next time that happens, why don't you just say those words? And I'm like, but what if it's just me? Won't God be mad if it's just me and I'm pretending that it's the Holy Spirit? Won't God be mad? The pastor goes, if he gets mad, I'll take your legs. <laughs> I think he understood what I didn't. That first of all, God wasn't going to get mad, so there wouldn't be any legs, right? <sighs> so the next time I'm praying, and I hear that sound of tongues in the back of my mind, I just said it. I didn't feel anything. 
But the spiritual things and emotional things are not synonymous. Sometimes when something spiritual happens, there's a great emotional release. And that's cool. That's amazing. But sometimes when spiritual things happen, you don't feel anything. So here I am, praying in tongues. First of all, I don't understand a word that I'm saying. And that's awkward. Secondly, there's nothing. I, there's no smoke. <laughs> there's no fire. There's there's no lightning flashes. There's no angels appearing. There's nothing happening except me praying in tongues. Because spiritual things and emotional things are not necessarily synonymous. I was talking to a friend about this. And he said, well, you know, I don't hear it in the back of my mind. He said, I see like a ticker tape, and it just has words printed on it, and I just read them off. I said, really? You mean God does it different ways with different people, different strokes for different folks, as my dad used to say. Someone else said, well, I don't hear it, and I don't see it. It just kind of comes up out of the inside of me. So the important thing is not how it works. The important thing is simply that it works. Amen. I love the way Earl Roberts said it. He said, this speaking in tongues is a divine human cooperation. The Holy Spirit's job is to give you the utterance, to give you the words to say, to give you the sounds to make. And your job is to say them. And what I found happened when you do this is just what Paul said. He that speaketh in a tongue edifieth himself. In other words, when we pray in the Spirit, we strengthen ourselves. Jude verse 20 says the same thing. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Now I hear some people who are ignorant. <laughs> I'm just telling them the way it is. They just don't know. And they say, well, tongues is the least of First of all, you dingleberry. <laughs> this is a gift from God. Who are you to demean it in any way? It's a gift from God. How dare somebody say, well, that's the least of the gifts. I'll tell you something. Let me show you something here. Because I believe that praying in the Spirit is the gateway to all the gifts. Oral taught it like this. He said, 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says this, Let him who prayeth in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Okay. So when we pray in tongues, we don't understand what we're saying. It's a language we've never learned. It's an utterance that comes from the Holy Spirit. But there is a companion gift called the gift of interpretation of tongues. And Oral said it like this. He said, I pray in tongues, and then when I get to a stopping place, I just start praying in English without stopping to try to figure out what to pray. And he said, what I find is that I'm praying the interpretation what I just prayed in tongues. And there was a fellow named Ralph Mahoney who was the head of an organization called the World Missionary Assistance Plan, World Map. 
and Ralph added a new dimension to it because he pointed out that the, the word is not the gift of translation of tongues. It's the gift of interpretation of tongues. Now let me take it out of the spiritual context and, and explain this to you in a different way. Many years ago, I was doing a missionary trip to Mexico. We were in Mexico City, we had a night off. And so our hosts took us to the Ballet Folklorico there in Mexico City. At that night, the ballet was doing a famous uh, dance. I can't remember the name of it, but the, the gist of it, there was a story that was written about an Indian, a, a, a Mexican Indian, uh, years and years and years ago, whose family was hungry. And there was a great stag in the area. And so the Indian took his bow and arrow, and he, he stalked that stag, killed it, and brought it home for his family. Hey, that's the story. That story was interpreted into music. Somebody wrote that story in music. And if you listen to the music, you can hear the hunger of his family. And then you can hear his determination as he stalks that great stag. Then you hear when he shoots, and you hear the victory when he brings that back to his family. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Then that story that had been interpreted into music was interpreted into dance. And you had a guy out there in a headdress, and he's prancing and dancing around, you know, and you're going to see, oh, my family's hungry, ah, and such people. And then you see him with his bow and arrow, he's stalking that stag, and you see him shoot, and you see him pulling that stag back. Because there's a guy who's got a head, you know, headdress with antlers on, and he's dancing around there too. So the story was interpreted into music, and then it was interpreted into dance. Not translated, interpreted. So here's Oral, prays in tongues, gets to a stopping place, starts praying in English without stopping to figure out what he's going to pray. And that's one way that you can receive the gift of interpreting tongues. Ralph said, I don't do it that way. He said, I pray in tongues. And then I get a picture in my mind. That's the interpretation of what I prayed. The prayer was interpreted into a picture. Does that make sense? I was teaching this to the leaders of the church, and I had them pair up, and one would just pray in tongues for the other one for a minute, and then stop and see what the interpretation would be. One lady, now this is in Michigan, right? One lady prays in tongues for a while and then she stops and she goes, ah, this doesn't make any sense to me, but I just see a picture of a cactus. The other lady bursts into tears because she and her husband had been praying about whether or not they should move to Arizona. Oh, wow. uh, I think that might be a little bit of an interpretation that was meaningful to that person, right? Like a word of knowledge. You see, they moved to Arizona. They've lived in Scottsdale for probably close to 35 years now. Now, watch this. I'm praying for you. I don't know what you need, so I'm praying in tongues. And the Holy Spirit knows exactly what you need, doesn't he? And so he's going to pray for the thing that he thinks you need the most, right? So I'm And I find myself praying things for you that you need that I don't know anything about. What is that? That gift of interpreting tongues became the vehicle 
from words of knowledge. Does that make sense? I'm praying for you. I don't know you have cancer. I find myself praying about cancer. Well, what happens? That's a word of knowledge. Often the gifts of the Spirit cluster together. Suddenly, oh, the Holy Spirit has revealed that you're struggling with cancer. What happens? A gift of faith rises up, doesn't it? God knows I had this. He wouldn't have revealed that if he didn't want to heal me. Faith rises up, then what happens? Gifts of healing come in response to that faith. The working of miracles comes. And how did all that start? It started because somebody prayed in tongues. I don't even know what to say. This, I just get so excited because here is access to all the gifts of the Spirit just from that least of the gifts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about healing just for a minute. One of the things I learned several years ago a fellow named Bill Johnson pastored a church in Redding, California called Bethel Church. And I was listening to Bill, and he said the Hebrew word for testimony literally means do it again. Now, folks, my parents got married on Saturday night, and they were in church Sunday morning. Does that give you a clue how our family operated? If the doors were open, we were there. So I have been in church all my life, and I had never heard that the Hebrew word for testimony means do it again. And somebody that I know used to say, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. And so I'm like, well, I'm, I don't care what Bill Johnson says. I'm going to check it out for myself. So I go to my resources, and I look, and guess what? The Hebrew word for testimony literally means do it again. <laughs> now, Revelation tells us the testimony of Jesus is the spirit What I understand that to mean is that when we tell the when we tell the supernatural things that God does, we prophesy the potential for Him to do it again. So you, you probably don't know this. In 2012, I just got back from Russia and. My wife and I were on our way to visit her mom in a nursing home. A lady ran a red light and hit us doing about 65 miles an hour. I spent 51 days in the hospital and that meant that I was done as the pastor, the lead pastor of this church. I just, I, I tried to come back. I worked 10 hours a week. I worked 20 hours a week and then I was like, okay, I can't do this. I just don't have the stand. Turn my church over to somebody else. When we first got out of the hospital, we were both in wheelchairs, and so we had to have attendant care. So one of the ladies that came to help us was a woman named Patricia. And Patricia was a very sunny person. She was always smiling and laughing and making jokes. One day she comes to work, and she is not sunny. And so I said, Patricia, what's wrong? She says, well, Lonnie, a few years ago, I had colon cancer. And I went through chemo, and I went through radiation, and they did surgery, and they thought they got it all, and I hadn't had any symptoms, but I just came from the doctor's office. He did x-rays, and he tells me I have seven tumors in my colon. One of them is the size of a grapefruit. In two weeks, I'll go back to the doctor 
and he'll tell me what his plan is to deal with this. And it just rose up on the inside of me. Patricia, this is not God's will for you. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Patricia, there is not any colon cancer in heaven. And so God does not want there to be colon cancer down here. Can we pray for you? Well, she was from a Catholic background, and the Catholics believe in miracles. And she said, well, of course. So now here's, here's the thing where you lean not on your own understanding, all right? Diane and I rolled our wheelchairs <laughs> over <laughs> to Patricia. <laughs> And we laid our hands on her and began to pray. And in a minute, she starts sweating. And she says, I'm so hot, what are you doing to me? And I said, Patricia, sometimes when God's, sometimes when God's power comes, it feels like heat. It's okay, heat is good. We prayed for her every day that she worked that next two weeks. And every time we prayed for her, this doesn't happen very often, but every time we prayed for her, she would start sweating and say, I am so hot, what are you doing? Heat is good, heat is good. She goes to, oh, I forgot to tell you, she also had a, an infection in her blood. She had been on IV antibiotics and they couldn't. So two weeks goes by. She goes to her doctor, does a blood test, does the x-rays. The doctor comes in in a minute and he says, honey, I'm sorry. Uh, you're going to have to go do those x-rays again. They didn't have the machine set up right. So she goes and does them again. <laughs> comes back and she's waiting in the office. And the doctor comes in and says, I, you know, I don't know what they're doing over there. You're going to have to go get the x-rays the third time. She goes and gets them the third time. The doctor comes back in and he says, and I quote, what the hell is going on? Because <laughs> all the tumors, all the tumors, even the ones that the size of a grapefruit, are gone. And the blood infection is gone. Listen, this girl, this, this is hilarious to me. This girl sat in the doctor's waiting room for the rest of the day, just trying to get her head around the reality that she was healed. No chemo, no radiation, no surgery. Jesus had healed her. So fast forward a few years. The end of August. I get contacted by the daughter of a family that used to live across the street from us. They had moved from Grand Rapids to Las Vegas, and we sort of lost contact. But the daughter instant messages me and says, Lonnie, I need to talk to you. So I gave her my number, she calls me. Lonnie, my mom wanted me to call you. She has stage four cancer. They found it in her uterus, but it's not uterine cancer. It's a rare, aggressive form of cancer that's come from someplace else. And she wants to know if you will do her funeral. And I said, I'm honored that you would call. Of course, I will do her funeral. But Megan, this is not God's will for your mom. He taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no rare aggressive forms of cancer in heaven. And so he doesn't want there to be any cancer here. And I told her Patricia's story. Remember, the Hebrew word for testimony literally means do it again. So in a few days, Donna, the mom, calls me. She asks me, will I do her funeral? But this is not God's will for you. <laughs> and 
And I told her Patricia's story. And I said, can we pray for you? And she's a Christ follower. She had people praying for her all the place. We prayed for her. She had two weeks until she would go back to the doctor. The doctor would do tests and tell her her prognosis. How long do you have? Two weeks go by. They did two MRIs and a PET scan. No cancer to be found. See, I, I, now listen to me. In the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant that God made with the Jews, the Holy Spirit came on prophets and priests, judges, and kings, right? The normal average Jewish person that was part of that covenant couldn't have the Holy Spirit come upon him. But we live in a new covenant that's based on better promises. And God's plan is that the Holy Spirit would come upon every person who believes in Jesus. Now, when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit, well, first of all, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicted us of sin, right? He's the one who opened our eyes to see that Jesus is the only way to the Father. So he's been at work in our lives before we even put our faith in Christ. Then we put our faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and he lives inside us and he changes us. The, the New Testament calls says we're born again. We're born from above. We're changed. Another place says that we become partakers of his divine nature. We're a new creation in Christ. But Jesus said to his followers two things. After the resurrection in John 20, Jesus says, God has been there. He breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you a question. Did they receive the Holy Spirit then? That's not a trick question. Except you're afraid to answer because you're afraid it's a trick question, aren't you? Yes, they received the Holy Spirit. That's when the disciples were born again. The Holy Spirit indwelt them at that point. But what did Jesus say? He said, guys, now remember, these are the men that he has personally discipled for three and a half years. And he tells them, fellas, you've got to stay in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, so many people think this was for the apostles, and it was for the apostles. But you know what? There were 120 people in that upper room. There were only 11 apostles because Judas had kicked the bucket. So that leaves 109 people, if my math is correct, who were not apostles, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, for all those of you who might be from a Catholic background, Mary was in the room when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Mary was speaking in tongues. So God's plan is for all of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just like the apostles were, just like Mary was. Now watch this, you're not gonna think I'm crazy. Just like Jesus was, because you know what? We have no record of Jesus doing any miracles until he was baptized in the Jordan River by John, came up out of the water, and John saw the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove and abiding on him. Jesus did not do the miracles that he did because he was the Son of God, because Philippians tells us that he laid aside his, the independent exercise of his deity. Jesus did what he did because he was a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. 
Jesus said, I did not say this, Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do. Folks, we are living far below our privilege yeah. Yeah. as children of God who have access to the Holy Spirit. I don't say that to condemn you, to condemn me. I say that to call us up, to call us to be intentional about praying in the Spirit. Do you know when you can pray in the Spirit? Oral talked about it. He said, when I first got into this, he said, I prayed in tongues when I was really sad and burned, when I was emotionally distraught, then I could pray in tongues. And he said, and if I was really happy, if I was thrilled about something, then I could pray in tongues. Let me ask you a question. When is the Holy Spirit praying All the time. So when can you pray in the Spirit? <laughs> all the time. All you, all you have to do is just tune in. Mando roca sa tre di chi kindravas. Hu grande si tre di chi. Do you see? It's that simple. Did anybody see any cloven tongues of fire? Is there any smoke? Anybody get any electrical shocks? Me either. It's not about that. It's about responding to the Holy Spirit's invitation to join Him in prayer. <laughs> this, is, this is so much fun. This is so much fun. Okay. So, it's important to me That, that you not think, ooh, Lonnie must have some cool healing anointing. And that's why these miracles take place. It's not that. I have no more access to the gifts of the Spirit than you do. It's just that I've been praying in tongues a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I'm a, this is my first closing. All right. <laughs> a, about a year or so ago, I, was, I started waking up at four stinking o'clock in the stinking morning. And I, my eyes would pop open. And I wasn't waking up because I had to go to the bathroom either. My, my eyes would pop open and I would hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit say, get up and pray. And I'm like, oh. It's, do you know what time it is? It's four o'clock in the morning. And I wish I could tell you that every morning I leapt out of bed and prayed victoriously in tongues for an hour, but that would be a lie. <laughs> but a lot of mornings I did I got up and I went in the living room I sat down in a chair and I quietly prayed in tongues for an hour I think that when we're faithful to the promptings of the spirit even when it's hard you ever been out someplace and, and you just get this little nudge? You need to go talk to that person. Lord, I don't know what to say. Just shut up and go over there and talk to them. So you kind of go over there. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> you got to start with something, right? for so many people in gas stations, in Costco, because you start talking to them and you find out 
It's amazing. They just start telling you all their problems. And you just say, well, can I pray with you? And they, I have only had one person say, no. And then, well, you idiot, what's the matter with you? <laughs> We're supposed to be light in the darkness. Here's a great story. This is my second closing. <laughs> This lady driving down the road, and this thought comes through her mind. I want you to get out and go in that 7-Eleven and go over the freezer case and stand on your head. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Her immediate response is, I would puke you down. <laughs> oh, no. And she drives right on by. But that thought wouldn't go away. And so eventually she said, okay, I said, you are my Lord, I'll do what you say. I just hope this is really you. <laughs> so she turned around and she went in and she went over to the freezer case and she stood on her head. And the guy behind the counter burst into tears and said, there is a God. Because he had just said, Lord, if you're real, have somebody come in that door and go over to the freezer case and stand on their head. Wow. <laughs> you guys are all going to be going by 7-Elevens like this. <laughs> Lord, I don't know how to stand on my head. <laughs> I just want you to I, I, trust in the Lord. And not in the not all understanding. Doesn't make any sense to go in there and stand on your head. It's not about it making sense. It's about trust and obey. <laughs> to be happy in Jesus. But to trust and to obey. Okay. This is my third closing one. <laughs> what I'd like to do. Um, some of you may need to go. And so uh, what I'd like us to do, I want to just, I want us to pray. Uh, and I want us to pray for healing. Anybody need healing here? Anybody not need healing? That might be. <laughs> so here's what I want us to do. Uh, we're just going to pray together. And I'll hang out here as long as we need to. If you want me to pray for you, I'd be delighted to do that. But I want us all to pray together. And let's simply ask the Holy Spirit to come with his anointing, with his gifts of healing, or his working of miracles, with gifts of faith, whatever it is that we need to see his kingdom come and his will done here in us as it is in heaven. So if you have pain in your body, you have some place where you know there is an issue, what does the scripture say? They'll lay hands on the sick, right? So lay hands on yourself. And let's pray. You, ready? you got your hands? <laughs> Put them where you hurt. Ha. <laughs> <sighs> Thank you, Father. I want you to know tonight that I have spoken the truth tonight, and I am in your midst. Reach out and touch me right now, and I will heal whatever hurts you. In my name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are good. And you taught us to pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, we want that to start in us. And so we pray, come your kingdom in us as it is in heaven. Lord, let your healing anointing, let your healing virtue begin to flow into each person here. In Jesus' name, 
Lord, we rebuke every spirit of infirmity and affliction in the name of Jesus. Your power is broken. We break your assignment in Jesus' name and we command you to go in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we lose your healing anointing, your healing power into each person here under the sound of my voice. Lord, let healing come. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody having problems with your left leg? You just see a picture of like your thigh down towards your ankle. Anybody have issues like that? You got two takers. I'll tell you what I want you to do. Would you just come over here? Sit down by her, and I want you guys just to pray for each other. All right? <laughs> now, see, that was a word of knowledge. I didn't have any lightning bolts. I just had kind of a mental image of a lower left. Very simple. Just. Sit down right here. <laughs> you, well, then you're right on time. <laughs> okay, you guys just all just join right in with them. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Let your healing. because I've already gone over. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. I just, I got excited. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Okay. Well, when we finish, come up here and we'll pray. All right? Here's, here's something I want you to see. I love it when things are miraculous, instantaneous, pow, seven tumors disappear. That is so dramatic. You know what? Probably one of the greatest healing miracles I ever saw. A friend of my dad's had a stroke. He was in the hospital and dad asked me to go see him. I went into that hospital. I was just, I was serving on pastor's staff 22, 23 years old. I didn't know my head from a hole in the ground. When I walked in that hospital, there were tombs coming out of him all over the place. He was unconscious. They had him. He was naked on a table with a, t a towel draped over his waist. And I looked at that and I said, Lord, I don't have enough faith to pray for a miracle. And I hear the still, small voice of the Spirit. Take the most life-threatening thing and pray for that. So I went to the nurse and I said, this is my fourth closing, I guess. It's a new record. I said, I said what is the most life-threatening thing that's happening to Milo right now? She said, we can't get his blood pressure stabilized. It's all over the map. It's got to be stabilized went back in the ICU and laid hands on him and prayed for his blood pressure to stabilize. A few days I came back. How's Milo doing? 
Well, his blood pressure stabilized. And I said, what's the most life-threatening thing for him right now? Well, he's got to regain consciousness. I went back in and prayed. Come back in a few days, his eyes are open. He's awake. What's the most life-threatening thing? He's paralyzed from his nose down. That paralysis has to begin to recede. Otherwise, he won't be able to eat. He'll never regain his strength. I went in and began to pray for the paralysis to recede. The last time I saw Milo, he was walking with a cane. Had a little bit of a drag to his lip on one side. When you go to the doctor and he gives you a pill to take, do you take one pill and go, ooh, I'm healed? No. What do you do? You take the whole prescription, right? I love it when there's a miracle of healing and it's instantaneous. But I probably see more people healed, like Patricia, where we prayed for her every day she worked for two weeks. Or I prayed for Milo over a series of weeks. Do you understand? So when you, when you start looking, you guys have prayed for your legs to be healed, you start looking. And don't look for pain. Look for improvement. Okay? Because you may go, oh, no, there's still pain there. It must not have been healed. Listen to me. If pain was at a seven before you prayed, and now it's at a five, healing, isn't it? Yeah. And you just go, whoa, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and you just keep standing and praying and agreeing. I heard someone say one time, if you pray more than once for something, the first time you prayed in unbelief, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Jesus prayed for the blind man twice. That ought to give me license to pray four or five hundred times. <laughs> Do you see Okay. I don't know what to add except I really learned more about the operation of the gift from this. I call him a young man because I think everybody quit growing back when I know him. Uh, but uh, you know, that's kind of humbling for me. You know, for Bishop Moody, far more time. Lonnie, far more to give you. I think we humble ourselves, like we see, regardless of age. You know, and another thing I learned is when they went in to the kingdom, the war of the land, ten spies came back with the negative report, only two with a positive. You know, I said there's wall cities and there's giants. Anything you need, and God's trying to open your understanding, you're always going to find some false brethren, and you're always going to find some, something weird that's going to turn you off. See, I know traditional Pentecostal, I don't know, probably have two or three years have this, how about Lord Roberts and the Nine of Red Jesus? Well, I don't know about whatever. You know, what's I got to do with this young man and all the wonderful things he learned? A.A. Allen, all the things that this man saw and learned from him. Oh, yeah, 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 I already had a drink. <laughs> you had a drinking problem. You got any problems? You know, I don't know, you know. Does that, does that, I used to have every book he had because I, Designed for the ministry once and moved, I lost them all. I wish I had every one of them. The great man, Rabbi Zachariah. Oh, did you hear about Rabbi? And he's throwing away all his books. I don't know. Are you kidding me? You know, are you going to walk around everything and quit putting up barriers and receive the truth? I would love to have this young man come. This man, excuse me. Uh, this man come and spend a weekend with us sometime and just teach us these things, you know. Uh, 
I'm humble when I hear him, you know, I'm like a bull in a china closet. He just stands up here and laughs and teaches and makes it so clear and interesting. And I just sat there amazed, you know. I just, and I, just, I really love him. I love Larry, Steve, John, and all of us have different personalities. Timothy has a totally different personality. And God makes us all effective. And they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. You know, I don't have to measure up with any of them. I don't have to be like anybody else. I have to be myself. Because I will touch people, they'll think all the rest of you are goofball. But somebody especially needs to hear exactly what I'm saying and to hear what everybody's saying. But we're going we're gonna to have you back. And uh, we've we'll talked about it sometimes. We've talked about it two or three times and never done it. And uh, I think the enemy always puts something up. But uh, thank you. You really ministered to me tonight. And I'm going to have you pray for me before you go. You're dismissed.